Amen. Amen. As we continue worshiping the Lord, we're going to sing in a moment that the Spirit, we want the Spirit of God to fall fresh on us. And uh, in my message this morning, we're going to be talking about the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection as well, as God is going to give us a glorified body someday. And so, how is it all going to come about? The Spirit of God is going to make great changes in our life. And listen to how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, in verse 9. He says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And so one of the indications that you are a child of God is that you have the Spirit of God in you. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him, Jesus, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. May the Lord be glorified as we sing about the Spirit of God falling fresh on us.
seated as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord. Thank you, guys. All righty. I'm going to turn the speaker off, if you don't mind. It's kind of bothering me. Noise kind of ringing and vibrating and stuff like that, you know, distracting. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? You sure? Glad you're here? Well, that's good. I know you are, right, sister? Amen. Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're working through this letter, 1 Corinthians, and now we find ourselves in the longest chapter in this letter, chapter 15, and we're looking at today verses 20 to 28 which will be the topic of discussion, is the resurrection and the culmination of all things. A little eschatology, that's a theological word for the study of end times. The study of end times will come out in this text that we're looking at. As a matter of fact, in between verses 23 and 24, so much is happening in regards to eschatology in the end times that... um, we're going to leave 1 Corinthians for a little bit and just kind of talk about some other things that are, going, that are going on in the New Testament regarding the coming of Christ that I think you'll, your eyes are going to be opened up to some things that maybe you haven't heard of before, you haven't heard of in a while. But as verse 24 says right there in the beginning, then comes the end. Then comes the end. The culmination of all things are going to come out in our in our passage today that I believe will be a sobering thought for all of us to realize the day that we are living in right now. Would you um, open up your copy of the Bible, use your gadget, follow along in your copy of Scripture. I want to read verses 20 to 28 and then ask the Lord's blessing and we'll get into this passage. Hear the word of the Lord. God's word says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in its own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at His coming. Then comes the end, when He, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For He, Jesus, must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he, God, the Father, who put all things under him, is exempt. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him, who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that uh, some of the complicated things that are in this text that we're looking at this morning would become crystal clear for each person here this morning, those who know you and those who don't, that the reality that this life that we have right now will come to an end. And the new heavens and the new earth that you promise in which righteousness is going to dwell and that you're going to be overall God Almighty over all, ruling as you ought to. Lord, may this this section of Scripture prepare our hearts and speak to us and cause us to see the reality of this topic and may it help us turn to you in obedience in all ways and all things. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
the importance of today's message is, is always of utmost importance. Every, every message, I suppose, I could say is really important for us to listen to, but this message is really important. As the more I spent time studying it, the more I, it sobered me up, made, caused me to realize the seriousness of the scriptures here. But it also excited me to make me realize the times that we're living in and, and to make me realize how important the resurrection of Jesus Christ is. That if that resurrection never took place and so many other things that God has promised to the believer, even his, his, what he's doing on earth, all of the things, all of the things regarding the end times would not come to pass if the resurrection of Christ did not come to pass. Paul had to remind the Corinthians about the central message, the gospel, the importance of that gospel message. And he did that throughout this chapter. He's been reminding them of the gospel, of how important it is. And then the section that we studied last week, Paul is coming off of that section with more certainty. But he began in verse 12 by saying, some of you are saying that the resurrection of the dead does not take place. And then he began to give seven arguments that we looked at last week that I'm just real quickly going to go through again to show the importance of the resurrection. Seven powerful truths that if the resurrection of Christ did not take place, seven powerful statements and realities and truth would not have come to pass either. And so he says, if Christ is not, if, if you preach, you're preaching that Christ is risen from the dead, but if, if he did not rise again from the dead, then there is no resurrection. And if there is no resurrection, then Christ himself has not risen from the dead. And what does that mean then? That would mean that Christ is still in the grave. That would mean that, that Christianity is no different than any other religion that's in the world, that death has its victory over all people. You cannot separate Christianity from any other religion. Jesus is still in the grave. There is no gospel. There is no good news. We have nothing to really preach. We have nothing to say to anybody. Christianity is just like every other religion out there. There is no victory over death if Christ is still in the grave. And therefore, we have no message to preach. And then he goes on to say, not only that, our preaching is empty. Our faith is also empty. And then we, verse 15, have become liars. Every preacher, every apostle, every person who's ever said that Christ has risen from the dead are all liars. They've lied to us. And if they've lied to us, the Word of God is full of lies. The Bible cannot be trusted. And if the Bible cannot be trusted, God Himself cannot be trusted. It's a reality we need to think about. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And here it is. You're still in your sins. You have no forgiveness. You have no gospel. And then verse 18, all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Think about that. Every person who's ever died, there was nothing to look forward to. Nothing for us to look forward to. We're never going to see anybody They've perished. They've, they, they have been eternally damned, and there's no afterlife whatsoever. The atheist is right. We just sit in the grave and we rot. And then the final thing that Paul says, that the reality that there is no resurrection of Christ, then in this life only, if we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most pitiable. We're fools for sacrificing and living and putting our lives on the line and living by faith and all the things that we do as Christians. It's all, we're all fools for doing it because there is no resurrection in this life is the only life that we have. And so those are all ifs, if this, if this, if this, if that, right? Now look how verse 20 starts. Verse 20 starts with certainty, but now Christ is risen from the dead. My brothers and sisters, if you're into saying amen and praise the Lord, that's a good time to do it because Christ has risen from the dead. And everybody say amen, Amen, praise the Lord. And so with certainty, he begins this section 
of the importance that Christ has truly risen from the dead. And in light of God's plan for all end time, we see that this resurrection from the dead guarantees that we too will rise again from the dead. And that God's plan, not only that that one thing lays upon the other thing, that if Christ didn't rise again from the dead, then we won't rise again from the dead. But since he did rise again from the dead, you and I know for sure that we will rise again from the dead. And then the next thing that happens is going to be the restoration of all things. God is going to bring, bring a restoration of all things as it was in the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Think about that. All of this rests on the resurrection of Christ from the dead. So since Christ has risen from the dead, you and I can have certainty that God is going to bring an end to everything Everything in this world that opposes God, everything in this world that is against God will one day be brought into subjection to glorify God as they ought to. As it was in the beginning, the shalom, the peace that was on the earth when God first created the world is going to come to pass because the resurrection of Christ did come to pass. And since the resurrection of Christ did come to pass, all of this sets in motion all of these things. The resurrection guarantees our resurrection and the restoration of all things. So in short, in this short little passage, verses 20 to 28, Paul has traced paradise lost and regained and the recovery and the submission of all things to God as it was in the beginning of creation, and it is because Christ's resurrection has truly taken place, and it guarantees it all. Amen? And so, with all that said, let's look at these verses of Scripture in chapter 15, verses 20 to 22. It says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Paul uses a word that we don't normally see. It's called the first fruits. We don't see that in the New Testament. It's not words that we use, but it's a, it's a, a word that is used in the Old Testament. Christ has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ his resurrection from the dead is the first fruits. And our resurrection is guaranteed to follow. In other, word, in other words, His resurrection from the dead guarantees or secures that our resurrection is going to follow. And not only that, it sets in motion not only one person's resurrection, but every believer's resurrection is guaranteed to follow because Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul is using an, an analogy from the Old Testament to demonstrate what Christ's resurrection means for you and I today. Before the Israelites could harvest their crops and, and gather all the things that they've planted and live off of their crops, before they could do that, they would have to bring to the priests a representation of those crops which were called the first fruits. And they brought this to the priest. The full harvest could not be made until the first fruits were offered. Listen to how the Lord talks about this in Leviticus 23.10. As the Lord is speaking to Moses, he says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. The point of Paul's analogy here is that Christ's own resurrection was the first fruits of the resurrection harvest of every believing dead person, everyone who dies. It's, a, it's an analogy that he's using. So in the death and the resurrection of Christ, when Christ made an offering of himself to the Father on our behalf. And so the significance of the first fruits not only was, were they to proceed the harvest, but they were the first installment 
of the harvest. The fact that Christ was the first fruits, therefore, indicates that something else, namely the harvest of the rest of the crop, is going to come. In other words, listen, Christ's resurrection could not be in isolation from our resurrection. He is the first fruits that guarantees every resurrection that will come after that because his resurrection was part of a larger resurrection that would come to pass, namely you and me, every redeemed person. And so Christ's resurrection is the first fruits, and it guarantees every resurrection to come to pass after that. You notice the term that he uses here in verse 20. He says, Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Isn't that a nice, polite way to talk about death? You've just fallen asleep, right? But you know that term is not used for people who don't know Jesus. It is only used for people who know Christ. So you know what that means? That our death is not really a death. It's not a permanent one. We only go to sleep. We're only temporarily in the grave. And someday Christ is going to call us with a shout. And we're going to come back to life. Amen? That's a wonderful truth that the Word of God gives to us. Death for God's people is only temporary. And then in verse 21, he continues explaining why. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And so Jesus had to take on human form. Jesus had to take on a human body. He had to come in the flesh so that he can taste death for everyone, Hebrews chapter 2, but also so that he can rise again from the dead. He can die and come back to life and be a representation for all those who would put their trust in Jesus. He had to become a man so that he can overcome death for us. He continue, continues to explain the importance of this. In verse 22, he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Two different people he's describing. For as in Adam all die, and in Christ all are going to be made alive. This phrase of in Adam all die is a reference to the man's first sin, the first man, Adam, when he sinned against God. He was a representation for all people who would come after him. And so whatever happened to Adam is going to happen to every person who is still in Adam. And then the same truth could be said of those who are in Christ. But here he says that in Adam all die. And this is why death is in the world, my friend. Death is in the world because Adam sinned against God and he brought death into the world. His sin brought death in the world. All in Adam die. Paul says the same thing in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as though one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Do you see that? Every person born into this world is born into this world with a death sentence. They're going to die, and they get that because Adam represented every person, all mankind. All who are in Adam will die, even so all in Christ shall be made alive. But there needs to be a clarification in this phrase, but all in Christ shall be made alive. It is also actually qualified, if you look at your verse, the scripture there, for as, as in Adam all die, he says, even so, in Christ all shall be made alive. The, qualifi the qualifier there is this. The word all doesn't mean every single person is going to be made alive. That would be universal salvation. That would mean that every person is going to be saved and on their way to heaven. But the qualifier there is in Christ. Very important. Not every person is in Christ. You understand that, right? In other words, you're not born in Christ, you're born in Adam. So there's two kinds of people in the world. There are those who are in Adam still, and there are those who are in Christ. And if you were in Christ, you shall be made alive. Now the question is, how do you get in Christ? You're not born that way. We're born sinners, separated from God. 
we are placed in Christ that when in a moment of time, whenever it could be for me, it was in, in October 30th, 1988, I humbled myself. I realized I was a sinner on my way to hell. I disobeyed God and I called out to the Lord to save me. And the moment I did that, I was placed in Christ. And so whatever happens to Jesus is going to happen to me. Every person here, you're either in Adam or you're, you're in Christ. When was it for you? When, when, when was it that you turned from your sins and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? When did you do it? If you've never turned from your sins and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're still, listen, you're still in Adam. And if you're still in Adam, then death has a hold on you. And death has victory over you. And when you die, you will face a second death. That's worse than the first one. The first one is just a physical death. The second death is an eternal death in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Every single person who is not in Christ will experience the second death. They'll be separated from God forever and ever in the lake of fire. That ought to concern you. It ought to bother you. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. Church, we need to wake up. If you love Jesus, if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, wake up. There are countless of people all around us that are still in Adam. You could be married to one. You could be living with one. But you're living a bunch around a whole bunch of people that are still in Adam that need to be in Christ, and we need to speak to them the gospel because it's only by believing in Jesus they get saved. And talk to people about Jesus, would you, please? Invite people to church so they can hear the living gospel that changed their life. These pews ought to be full. The Spirit of God wants to work. We're grieving the Holy Spirit when we're not obedient to God's commands. Church, we need to wake up. We're either in Christ or we are in Adam right now. Listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Never die. He is the resurrection and the life. Wow. Powerful, powerful words of Jesus. If he is your savior, you're never going to die. You're just going to sleep for a little while. But don't keep it to yourself. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. They'll become your friends. Amen. Paul continues here in verse 23, giving us the order of our, our, order of our resurrection. We're going to get a little technical here. Let me get to take a little bit of water. I'm going to put your thinking caps on here. Verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Here Paul, Paul describes that God is a God of order. He has set a plan in motion and it began with Christ and his resurrection. Then he says, afterward or next, all those who are Christ will be raised. All those who are Christ. I love that terminology. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are Christ. You belong to him. He's, he's your savior. He, he treats you. He's redeemed you. He loves you. He died for you. On Thursday night, we were talking about different um, ways in which the Bible describes that we are, we are now, we have a new identity, right? We are children of God. That's one way of looking at it. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we also are the bride of Christ. We belong to him. We're married to Jesus. We are his bride. He's, he's the husband, we're the bride, right? And so we have entered into a covenant, a relationship with him. And we belong to him. And so catch this. And when you think of your relationship with the Lord as he, as he is your husband and you are the bride and you are married to him forever and ever, right? Nothing can separate that, but think about it. What happens when you break the covenant and one person, which you know Christ can't do it, but the other person can, you and I can, we can mess things up. 
we, we do something that's called what? Sin. But listen, I want you to understand something. Sin is described in the Bible as adultery for a reason. When we sin, we're cheating on our husband. When we sin, we are violating the, 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 the covenant that we've made with God. Think about it, that, and that really helps us to say, I don't want to sin. I don't want anything to do with sin. I don't want sin in my life. I don't want sin in my kid's life. I don't want sin in my home. I don't want sin in my church. I don't want to hang out with sin, amen? I don't want nothing to do with it because sin is like adultery to God. It is, it is a betrayal. We're betraying our, we're supposed to be loyal to Him. And so as a Christian, I want to change. I want to become like Christ. I want to be holy. I want to walk with the Lord. I don't want to sin. And the motivation for wanting to change and, and not sin is that I'm the bride of Christ. I'm married to Him. He's my Savior. He's my husband. It's kind of weird if you're a guy. I understand that, right? But get over it. It's the description of the Bible gives to you. Humble yourself. That's what you are. You are married to the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, burial, burial and resurrection secured all those who are in Christ. They belong to Him. He won you. Now listen, a lot of things are going to change. He got a great plan for you. Gave you a body for a reason. And that body is going to be raised again from the dead. And God's going to give you a glorified body. Otherwise, why did He bother giving you a body? He gave us a body for a reason. And this is all going to happen. Look at the verse 23. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Jesus is coming, amen? He is coming back. Now, in between verse 23 and 24, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm going to go through it really quickly, so put your thinking caps on. There are two resurrections that the Bible talks about. There's the first resurrection. It begins, it begins at his coming, in which with the Bible talks about a rapture, and then after the rapture will be seven years of tribulation that will come upon this earth. But simultaneously at that rapture, which we don't know when it's going to come, the Lord says over and over again in Matthew 24 about six different times, no one knows the hour or the time. We don't know when it's going to be. It's going to be sudden, and it's going to be immediately. It's going to be a rapture of everyone who belongs to Christ. We'll be raptured out of here. But before that rapture of everyone living happens, something else is going to happen kind of simultaneously, but they're kind of like, if that's them, this is us right there, okay? Catch me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. There's the first resurrection, okay? That's how it begins right there. The dead in Christ. So everyone from Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, everyone, every believer from Pentecost all the way to that rapture point or is what he's talking about there. The dead in Christ will rise first. And look at verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so, this first resurrection, resurrection happens, the dead in Christ are risen first, then we who are alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. Track, tracking with me? Just nod your heads, we get done faster. Okay? And as soon as that happens, so I believe that's, that's how it's going to be, right? As soon as that happens, there's going to be a seven-year period of trials and tribulations, which is called Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah, right? That's going to come upon this earth. Seven years of God judging this earth, pouring out His wrath upon this earth, and everyone is here. The church is not going to be here. It's called Jacob's trouble for a reason. Mostly Jewish people who have not turned to the Lord yet are going to experience trouble. They're going to be on the earth, and persecution and trouble is going to come to them. And the whole purpose of, uh, of it is for them to turn to the Lord. And many Jewish people, during the tribulation period, is going to be revival after revival after revival as God's judgment comes upon this earth. But He promises in Revelation 3.10 that He's going to keep us from that hour. Everyone who is a, who is a born-again Christian are not going to go through that tribulation period because the promise is in Revelation 3.10 He'll keep us from that hour. Then after the tribulation, we are told... At the end of that period, 
all those who will have come to faith during the tribulation period, there's going to be many people who get saved during the tribulation period, who, who put their faith in Christ during the tribulation, will be raised up to reign with Christ during the thousand-year reign of Christ, which takes place right after the tribulation period. So track with me. You ready? Rapture, right? We go to meet the Lord in the air. The dead in Christ go first. We're right behind it, right? And then after that, seven-year period where there's going to be trials and tribulations and persecution to come upon, judgment upon the earth. And, and right after that seven-year period, there's going to be a, a thousand-year reign of Christ. But right before that, Christ is going to raise people from the dead who trusted in Jesus, who trusted in him during the tribulation period. But it's still part of the first resurrection. It's still part of the first resurrection where he raises those from the dead. You want to hear? listen to this in Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls, these are believers, of those who have been he- beheaded. Can you imagine that, being a, coming to faith during the tribulation period? And you get your head chopped off of being a believer. For their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That's talking about unbelievers there. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in this first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So right after the tribulation period, there's going to be a a time where we're reigning with Christ, right? We will be there, and then all those who get saved during the tribulation period will also be raised again from the dead, and they'll be with the Lord for a thousand years, and that is the first resurrection. All right? Cool? Was that awesome? Now listen to this. There's also a second resurrection, or as the Bible says, a second death. But that is not going to be for believers. The the resurrection that's remaining will be for the unrighteous, unrighteous, who will be raised to damnation and eternal punishment at the end of Christ's thousand-year reign. In John John chapter 5, verse 29, the saved will have been raised to eternal life, and the unsaved will be raised to eternal death, which is the second death. And so, if you're an unbeliever, you die twice. You'll die a physical death, and then you'll die a second death, be separated from God for all eternity. So these two resurrections of the dead, the first is for God's people who are in Christ, who, who he, he is the first fruits and guarantees all, all that he, what I just uh, referred to you are all going to take place in these three stages that he, that he lays out for us. And finally, the second resurrection for all those who are in Adam who have never trusted in Jesus Christ. They rejected him, and they're going to experience a second death. They also, too, they also will be given bodies, a new body. It's a body suitable for eternal damnation. Now, verse 24. What does he say there? Then comes the end. I'm going to pause for a moment. Just think about that, folks. Then comes the end. Everything. It's over. Everything on earth is over. But it's just the beginning for greater things that's going to happen. Then comes the end. Then comes the end. This life, as we know it, will someday come to an end. So many of us live as though this is all we get. And you know you're guilty of it. I could be guilty of it too. We don't live for the future. We don't live with a view toward the future. But he says here in the Bible, the end is coming in which all of God's promises for his people will come to pass. We will receive the end of our salvation, the redemption of our bodies. It's going to happen. And the end will also come to each and every person who has ever said to themselves, and maybe you've said this before, I am young. I have plenty of time, and I can't be sure all this stuff is true, so I don't want to ruin my life, so I live for the present. I indulge in sinful lifestyle, 
hoping to buy some time. But the Bible says that life is like a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it vanishes away. It's going to be gone before you know it. Why? We are all mortal beings. We are all mortal beings who are created by God, created in His image. God created you and placed all of us in His image so that we would love and serve Him and live in this, on this earth to be His representation. And for the Christian, may I encourage you, God is going to reward you. God is going to reward you Christian, for all the risks that you have taken for His name's sake, every sacrifice that you've ever made, it's not in vain. The end is coming. And he's going to reward you for every sacrifice you've ever made, every risk you've ever taken. And so don't be duped into living just for today. The end is near. Invest in God's kingdom. Give Him your all. You will not be disappointed. But if you don't give Him your all, you will be. The end is near. The end will come. Look at these verses 24 to 28. Bring this to a close. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father. I'm looking back at 1 Corinthians 15. I'm reading these verses. When He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is exempt. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him and put an end, oh, I'm sorry, and put all things under him that God may be all in all. And so Paul closes this section with a view for us to consider what it's going to look like when the end comes. And he's speaking about after the thousand-year reign of Christ. The purpose for Christ coming and redeeming a people for himself. We sometimes think salvation is all about us. Right? And it is. We, we do get saved and we do benefit from it. But here it's saying quite clearly that salvation is not all about us, that that Christ is going to crush every enemy, all authority, everyone who is opposed to God. He's going to crush it all. And then he's going to deliver that kingdom to God the Father. So really, salvation is for who? It's for God. It's for God the Father. He left heaven on a mission to put an end to all opposition and everything that rules and has authority against God the Father. Jesus wins the war. He is victorious over every enemy. He mentions different authorities that he's going to bring uh, an end to. Those authorities are human and they're divine. Some of those authorities are people today who, re who shake their fist at God and say there is no God and live their life like they, they're the king. They're gonna, they're, he's going to bring an end to their rule. But it's also speaking of kings and kingdoms, and leaders, and authorities who reject God as supreme. He's going to bring their rule and their authority to an end. But it's also talking about demonic authorities. Every demonic and evil authority that right now reigns, Christ is going to bring an end to it. Amen? He's going to bring an end to all evil and all authorities. And then he says the last enemy that he's going to bring an end to is death. The last enemy, verse 26, that will be, de will, that will be destroyed. The word destroyed means bring, uh, render inoperative is death. Death will be destroyed. Do you know something? That death is not God's perfect plan for his creation. God didn't want anyone to die. He placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He gave them a wonderful life, and they would enjoy life forever. God created life. He said, there's one tree I don't want you to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And so their rejection of God brought death into the world. But God, God doesn't want death in the world. God wants peace 
Shalom, peace. And Jesus is part of God's plan to defeat death. And after he wins the war and is victorious, he defeats everything, and then he defeats death. What does he do? Celebrates? Woo! No, look what he says he does. He says that he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. He delivers the kingdom to God the Father. And what is he doing there? It's a picture of Jesus not saying, I'm not God. And you're only God the Father and I'm just, you know, here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all God, one God. But Jesus is showing his subjection, his submissiveness to God the Father. He, he is God highly exalted Jesus and allowed him to reign and, ex- and be exalted above every name on this earth so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But someday, Jesus, after he defeats all the enemies, every authority, every rule, and every opposition to, to God's kingdom, right? He wins it all. That's an amen. Amen. He wins it all, and then he takes it all, all of it, and he hands it back to the Father, and he submits to the Father as the Son. You see, God is all in all. He is supreme. The Father is supreme. It's just a matter of roles. It's not a matter of who's greater than the other. You understand that, right? Amen. And that's what Jesus does. He he delivers the kingdom. And so this is a picture of God's redemptive plan to redeem a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation who in the end will receive the redemption of their bodies. And what is that called? It's called total salvation. It's called glorification. Someday you'll be glorified. Someday you'll be able to share in the glory of Jesus. Amen. Someday we will all be able to participate in that wonderful, wonderful plan that God has, that he will give give us a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. He is God over all. And so, as you sit here this morning, the resurrection of Christ happened over 2,000 years ago, but it can make an impact in your life right now. If you are in Christ, He is the first first fruits of your resurrection. You too will someday be raised from the dead to die no more, and you will enjoy that glory. But the opposite is also true. If you sit here this morning and you're still in Adam, and you've not turned from your, your sins, and you, you, you have not turned to your Creator who gave you the very breath that you are breathing right now, turn to Him before it's too late. If you're still in Adam, turn to Him. Put your faith in Christ. And if you don't, death still has a hold on you. And after you die, you will experience the second death that will forever put you separated from God in the lake of fire. But listen, God has not prepared this for you. Do you realize that? God did not make hell for people. He created hell for Satan and his angels. But all those who reject God, who reject Christ as their Savior, will follow Satan and his angels to the lake of fire, and they'll be there forever. They'll experience a second death. You have a a wife that is praying for you right now. You have a son or a daughter who is praying for you right now. A mom and a dad is praying for their kid right now. They're in Adam still. Death has a hold on their life. They're in their sins and they don't realize it. They think that they, they're, they're indestructible, but they're not. Only God is. And God is in complete control of everything. He's even in complete control of death. Death is not over God. God controls it. And He sent His Son to give victory to every single person. You can have victory as well over death. I plead with you. You've not turned from your sins and placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it today. Do it today. Humble yourself and turn to God and say, God, please forgive me. I realize that I'm a sinner and need you to save me, and I trust you to be my Lord and Savior. Do it now. You're not promised tomorrow. You have today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is your opportunity. 
It's a window. The door is opened for you. The offer is being made today. Humble yourself. Turn to the Lord and receive his wonderful salvation that he's prepared for you. And so if you, will you bow your head? Bow your head and just think about what has been spoken. Perhaps you're sitting there and, boy, Pastor, you're pretty heavy today. And I'm burdened for this. I'm passionate because I know, I know the burden of knowing someone that's not saved. God has spoken to you. Respond. Turn to Jesus. During the invitation in a little while, you can come forward and let me know about it. Right where you're sitting, you can pray and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't let your pride send you to hell. Humble yourself and receive Jesus. You know it's true. You know it's true. Father, I lift my voice and pray for each person here that the reality of Christ being the first fruits and the resurrection over death and how it benefits each person or makes a second death so real. The end is coming. God, I pray that every person here would be sober, would realize, would be thinking about people they should be praying for, inviting the church, sharing the gospel with, thinking about a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife that they're praying for, or maybe even now someone is praying for themselves because they're lost. God, have your way in all of our hearts, and may we respond to your word, this invitation, accordingly. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' precious name. Why don't we all stand and sing uh, this song of invitation to the Lord? Watch and pray.